invest in the things that are going to make you successful, that are going to make whatever decision you made successful. So if you're going to hire people, train them. If you're going to have staff at all, continue to train them after new hire training. If you're going to take a technology initiative on, be willing to make changes to your business that are going to make it successful. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Freight Caviar Podcast. Before we begin, I wanted to give a special shout out to our sponsor, Tab LLC. They offer incredible support and opportunities for freight agents. Freight agents, wouldn't it be life-changing to have a higher commission split and a support team focus on helping you build your dream? At Tab, we pay our agents up to 80% of gross profit without compromising on technology or support. Make more money and guarantee a better experience for your customers and carriers by joining the team at Tab. It all starts with a short, enjoyable phone call with our leadership team to see the tab difference to learn more and schedule a quick call go to tab hyphen llc.com and change your future welcome back to another free caviar podcast episode today i am joined by ryan shriver the chief growth officer uh at metaphora and christian gebbies my co-founder at free caviar at shippers here i'm right what's going on i'm just enjoying this great Chicago weather yeah i like Glad to be here with you guys, but also when we met, if I was out playing golf in the middle of April. Yeah, yeah. No, it's beautiful because you're you used to live in Chicago. That's right. I lived here for twelve years. You lived here for twelve years, yeah. uh, and now you live in Austin. That's right. Yeah. All right. Can you uh, tell our audience and our viewers a little bit about yourself, where you're from, sure, how you got here? Yeah. So uh, I'm originally from Tampa, Florida. Uh, was born and raised. Uh, went to college in Tampa, uh, and then I moved to the Midwest because it's it's so hot. Can I curse on this? Oh, yeah, go for it. So fucking hot. <laughs> all the time. Like, it's just, it, people think, like, so the funny thing about, like, you know, grow, live in a place like that, growing up in a place like that, they're like, oh, man, it's, why would you ever leave? Like, oh, I love it. You know, you live where it's hot and humid like that 12 months a year, and it's just, it's not fun. Because, like, you have to live your life, you know, in, like, mm-hmm. it's 800 degrees uh, with the humidity. So I moved to the Midwest because I was like, I'd never seen snow. Well, you've wow. never played golf. I've never seen snow. <laughs> wow. I was 23 years old before the first time I saw snow. Like, literally. Like, uh, and so... What was that like? What was that experience like? Oh, I'll never forget it, man. Like, so, you know, I was in graduate school, and, uh, and like, it was October. So it was, like, kind of like an earlier snowfall. It was, like, early October. And I literally skipped class that day to, like, just, like, make a snowball for the first time. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like an yeah. adult. I called my mom, you know, I'm like, Mom, it's snowing. And she's like, I'm on a conference call. I'm like, hangs up on me. <laughs> it's like, I don't get fucked. You? you know, it's snowing or whatever. So no, it's snow. Yeah. But so it was like, it's great. I mean, it's still snow to me. So like, I've never had to, you know, I lived in, I lived in, uh, I lived in East Lansing, Michigan. So like college town, you know, yeah. took the bus or walked or whatever. Didn't, you know, I lived in an apartment. I didn't have to shovel snow. And then I lived in the city of Chicago. Like I didn't have to shovel snow or whatever. You know, I didn't have a car. So like, sure. I had to like trudge through it a little bit, but it wasn't that big of a deal. So snow to me is still like magical you know it's like this really cool it's it's you know it's it's falling from the sky it's snow you know and so snow's like just still really cool to me so i skipped it i made a snowball and i could skip i could skip snow entirely except for going snowboarding yeah yeah yeah, 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 christian hates snow i like snow i like all seasons i think every season's got like some magic in it the only problem with the winter is just it's so fucking dark yeah it's so dark and moving back to the South again, you know, like I got another hour of sunlight as compared to Chicago, you know, so it's m- maybe more. So, you know, it's 4.15 yeah. here and it's pitch black, you know, down yeah. in Texas. It's like, I still got an hour of sun. You know, yeah. So, so I underestimate that. You moved from Tampa yeah. to the Midwest because it was That's so right. freaking hot. So I know you moved to Austin, which is also freaking hot. Like maybe not the winter. So this is a true story. So here's why I moved to Texas because that's where you're going. This is a god honest true story. So my wife... Neither of us is from here, right? So I'm from Florida. My wife is from San Antonio originally. Her, her dad was in the Air Force. They lived all of us. But so she, she only moved up here for me, right? So she comes home from work one day. She's working in the West Loop. We're living in North Center. She walked to the door. I swear to God, she walks in the door. She goes, I'm moving back to Texas with or without you. First thing she says to me, she walks to the door. God, honest, true story. I'm moving back to Texas with or without you. She's like, we can stay married. 
but like I'm only coming to visit in the summer. So I was like, all right, like that. I just fucking threw it down. So you know, yeah. So you know, I was like, all right, I guess we're moving to Texas. It took a couple of years for it to actually come to fruition, but yeah, she uh, she just like threw it down like that. I was like, all right, we're moving to Texas. It's not as hot. It's it's obviously hot. It's hot, but it doesn't have the humidity. Like it's not humid, and it's dry. Dry. dry it's a totally dry. different. It is just. Totally yeah, I mean, it can be 105 degrees outside, and like, I'll go outside and go for a jog or something, you yeah. know, and it won't fucking like, kill me. You wouldn't know from what team me that I can jog, but I can. And uh, <laughs> I don't like it, but, uh, you know, but so uh, I'll go outside, and fi- as long as you have enough water, it's fine. But yeah, so that's a true story. Okay. That's why we moved out to Texas. My wife just told me I had to. Very interesting. So moving out to freight and logistics. Sure. Um, you graduated law school. That's right. At Michigan State University. That's right. And what year was that? 2009. Okay, this was like during the recession. The, the Great Recession. Yeah. yeah, and I remember I was listening to you on the Joe Lynch podcast. If anyone wants to listen to get more details and Ryan, yeah. the Logistics of Logistics podcast with Joe Lynch. Ryan did a great interview on, on that show. And you, you explained it, I believe, that there was like nothing, no opportunities for you at the time? Yeah, it was crazy. So I moved here. I passed the bar. And, um, you know, so I graduated in the top. Mi- Michigan State's like a middle-of-the-road law school, or at least it was. I don't know what it is now. But I graduated like top 15% of my class, magna cum laude, like, a, you know, and, and I couldn't, I couldn't even get people to talk to me. Like I literally would wear a suit and tie. I'd walk around like resume and cover letter in hand. I'd walk in any law office I could find. Is there anybody to talk to me? Nobody would be able to talk to me. And then like, well, what was hard too was like nobody, I couldn't get any kind of job. I mean, the, the, the economy was obviously terrible for everybody then. I mean, it was a huge, but like I couldn't get I couldn't get jobs waiting tables or bartending or working retail because, you know, they were like, either I had a huge gap in my resume. It's like, well, what were you doing between college and now? Or they were like, okay, well, you're going to be an attorney. So, so no, it's funny you tagged no on this. Yeah. Yeah. LinkedIn. Um, so I got an, inter- I got an interview at Echo because I had a buddy, my buddy from law school, his cousin worked there and I was like, we were hanging out. I'm just, I just need a job, man. And so he got me an interview and, and, uh, I met with Noel and Noel like, I'm the, you know, sat across the table from me and he's like, you know, this isn't something you can do for like six months and like dip out, you know, cause like, you know, that was a reasonable expectation. Like, Hey, this guy went to law school. He probably wants to do that. And I was like, man, I'm just giving up on life. So it's fine. I'll be a freight broker, you know? And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of how it came to be, but it was an interesting, it was an interesting Tied, it was really terrible. So they you know, and Noam hired. Yeah, so Noam get Noam gave me my first chance in the industry, and Noam's been Noam's been incredible for my journey. Like he and I started the company together after I left Echo, and so I was going to leave and go. I met some guy in line at, at, at like the coffee shop that was in Echo's building at the time, and uh, he was an older African American guy, and he had a diversity consulting firm. Like he would work with like folks on on you know like fire departments and and and. I remember just fire departments was one example he gave me that like hired him because sure they had like some problem where they were like you know harassing sure the the people of color or like major corporations on like why diversity is important or whatever and so he heard me kind of like complain about working at Echo because I was like I could just do more like a trained animal could do my job as a freight broker like a trained animal could do this job like it doesn't require you to think it requires you to just like hammer the phones. And, uh, and so he's like, well, you know, a lot of people complain about their jobs. Not many people complain about their jobs because they want to do more. So I was going to leave and go work there. But then Noam was like, well, let's, why don't we start a brokerage? Why don't we start a company? And I was like, all right, let's do it. And so that was, uh, that started my sort of like entrepreneurial journey in, in logistics. So it was, it's been a wild ride. So you started uh, a brokerage Noam That's while right. being at Echo. No, no, no. We left Echo and started this brokerage. But I was leaving. So, yeah. So, to be clear, we were not... We were, we were not side... Up. Let me look at it again. We were not side hustling for brokerage while we worked at Echo. Please do not sue me. Um, but, yeah, we left and we started this uh, called Optimal Free. Yeah. And uh, and we started that business in 2011 or so. Yeah. So, I mean, I was like 11, 12 months into my career. I'm like, oh, we're like, we're like starting my own company. And then Jake and Phil were there too, right? Oh. So, so Phil was our first hire. Okay. Um, so Phil had grown up with um, Caleb, Gnome's, one of Gnome's sons. And okay. we're like best friends. So he needed a job. So we hired Phil. Do they know who Phil is? 
Oh yeah, for context, Phil Weber was like my boss for a few years. Shout out to Phil. Shout Great out. boss. Uh, at Phil is my follow. Yeah. I sad. called him Pat Finger Phil because you'd always yeah. mess up the rates. Yeah, uh, so bad. That's <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I called him Little Phil back then, but now we call him Pat Phil. Shout out Pat Phil. But yeah, so we hired Phil as a carrier. And dude, like, he got it right away. Like, there's, there's like people, yeah. you know, there's, there's guys who get it. And there's guys, and like, he, he, he got it. He just yeah. knew how to hustle freight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was sort of more or less a carrier rep, but like he, it's what's interesting about brokerage is like more often than not in the buy sell model as it exists today, the carrier reps end up using their sales abilities internally more than externally. And sometimes that's a good thing. Like sometimes it's a really good thing. What they're doing is they're like remarketing the capacity of their carriers internally, the sales reps to say, Hey, can you go get me some more of this freight? Um, where it turns sinister and where unfortunately most of the time you see it, it's, hey, like I turn my sales resources internally, like take this truck, even though we could probably get a better rate or whatever, whatever. But Phil really understood how to like remarket capacity right away internally. Hey, I, hey, do you have any more of those, you know, Henderson, Kentucky to, um, you know, to, to, you know, Zanesville, Ohio loads. Mm -hmm. I got to get my, my guys got three guys tomorrow. We got one tomorrow that can go to Minnesota, whatever it might be. Sure. So yeah, Fat Phil did a good job. So we hired Phil, like it was me and Noel, and then we hired Phil, uh, and then we kind of grew from there. And then Jake started maybe after two or so years. He started right before I left, so I left yeah. to start another brokerage, and um, and, and and Jake started right for them. But I was with, I was at Echo with Jake. Okay, that's yeah, that's right. That's that's my connection with yeah. Jake. So. And Jake should also shout out Jake Elf. Yeah, Jake Elfman from Everest. Shout AKA out. Magic Man. You know, yeah. Fat Fat Jake. He's still he's still <laughs> relatively thin. <laughs> Okay, so that was Optimal Freight. But you were just starting off as a broker in 2009, so, like, you were, like, relatively young. Yeah. Like, uh, starting. Yeah. I'll I mean, especially that. as compared to I am now. I'll read them. So, I guess, so I went to, I guess I was 20, I was 20, I guess I was 26 when I started at Echo or so. I'm 40 now, so, like, 25 or 26 when I started at Echo. Um, then we started Optimal Freight a year later or so, so I was 27, yeah. 28. And then I started uh, Spartan Logistics, which, um, you know, is here on the north side of Chicago. And I did that. And um, so I was, you know, I was 28, 29 or so when I started that company. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I had to learn. I, I, you know, it's it's interesting. Like, I'm a very outgoing guy. There's a lot of things that I've learned along the way. I, I, I tell people a lot of times, you know, you said to me, hey, you said when we were prepping, like, hey, you're a really smart guy. Like. I'm just the guy who touched the hot stove a lot of times. You know, if you're familiar with that analogy, right? When you have a kid, tell him not to touch the hot stove. I just, like, fucked up a bunch. <laughs> and I just made a ton of mistakes. And, and there's things, like, you know, that, that people tell you you're good at and you think you're good at them. I'm an outgoing guy, so, like, I always, you know, I was always told, oh, like, you're going to be, you're a great leader, or you, you know, you are a leader or whatever. I'm a terrible manager of people. Like, there's a difference between being a leader and a manager. So there's a lot of things I had to learn on the fly from just, like, screwing them up. And, and you talk about being young, like when I look back at being 28, 29 years old, I had no idea how to manage people or like build a team. Some people are just better at that than others. I mean, Kevin Nolan, who's a buddy of mine, like he's not, you know, he just, he was naturally good at building teams and being a, 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 a both a leader and a manager. And, you know, being a leader, setting a vision, getting people excited about things, but managing that, to, you know, Kevin just surrounded themselves with people that would really good at managing and he was really good at leading he still is uh those are things that i always that i had to kind of like learn how to do do you have any general pointers that you've picked up on for what good managing looks oh, like? oh yeah um be willing you know understand that you have to like understand that you're going to make um bad decisions like but don't let that stop you from 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 doing certain things like i was always worried i would i'd be worried about hiring because i was worried i was gonna make the wrong hire and like you know in an early stage company like the the hires that you make are really really important um and and then i didn't uh but i didn't do that i remember but i would get afraid but but a lot of it all of it comes down to two things one being willing to be wrong so you know when i do stuff like this now sometimes people are like you know what if you what if, like, you know, you say something and, or somebody asks you a question and you don't know the answer to, like, what, what do you do? I'm like, well, if I don't know the answer, I say somebody else is better at answering that question than me. So I'm willing to admit I don't know something, but I'm also willing to be wrong. Like, 
I'll give my opinion on something and say, hey, I might be wrong. But then the other thing is just like, listen. Um, I didn't do a very good job of like listening to people around me um, and like the advice I was getting. And I would always sort of like, I would always sort of, I would hear what they were saying, but I wouldn't listen. Well, here's all the reasons why that can't work for me. And, and so I, I would say to anybody, um, if there's a reason something's not working for you or there's a reason that, 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 that you're struggling to connect, and manage people, um, like, well, just listen better and like try to understand why, why things are the way that they are, and then be willing to do, be willing to make a mistake, and and sometimes that's going to mean hire somebody and then have to let them go. Sometimes it's going to be like, if you're not sure if you should, you know, a fire, firing is as important as hiring. I think this is a really important one. A lot of times, we see businesses, I see businesses today, brokers today that I, you know, we go in and work with or go in and look at that the reason they're struggling to grow is they won't, they won't let go of people that are look like high performers, but are holding the business back because they need somebody in the seat or because this guy's really great. Or even if it's a mid performer or low performer, they want more out of it. It's like, Oh, but like that I need, I already need more people. I'm going to have to go rehire that person. People end up stepping up. So I think that those are some of the, it's a little bit of a roundabout descriptor description, but I think that's invest in, um, Invest in just like, you know, learning and development and listening. So before we get into like the consulting side, okay. I'm at a forum, what you do. And I, I, I really like what you just were talking about and I want to dig deeper in that. Let's do it. But before we do that, I do want to kind of trek our way along that to, through the timeline. Okay. So you started Optimal Freight. That's right. Then you started Spartan Logistics. That's right. Okay. So what happened there? Like, why did you leave Optimal to start Spartan? Or if you don't want to talk about no, it. No, yeah. listen, like I'm a, I'm a, so Nate, when he started Bootstrapper's Guide to Logistics, he called me before he did it. Because Kevin Hill, y'all know Kevin Hill. Of course. So Kevin, you know, Kevin's let, told Nate, hey, he should talk to me about it. Because I had started a podcast with a relatively similar thesis. But my, my approach is very much like, and I only did like maybe six or seven episodes because it was just too much work. And uh, like it t- on top of a day job, and yeah. you guys did it. Sure. And I didn't even do any kind of research. You're like, I listened to this episode of this, and you and I know each other, so you didn't yeah. probably have to do that much work on me. But um, I just showed up and asked people questions. But what I wanted to explore was this concept of like fear of failure and imposter syndrome. Like, I think I think often people don't do things because they're afraid to fail, and they think that failure means failure means like they they lose their whole life. Like you, we were talking in prep, right, Chris, about how like you had to move back in with your parents after Audubon failed, whatever, like, and, and, but now you're in a better place than you ever would have been before. Right. Because like, you know, you end up failing up. And so people sort of think like, you know, failures and losing everything and being destitute for the rest of your life. It's not. So I wanted to talk to, and, and also that like how success and failure are not opposites. They are, inextricably linked and if you've never failed at anything or in any way you can't be successful and i think that was one of the things that i learned growing you know starting these businesses and not having the type of success that maybe i wanted to right like i started spartan the same time matt pyatt started arrive and i love matt pyatt matt pyatt's done a great job with arrive and like so obviously the market was still not oversaturated like you could grow a billion dollar company but Matt did a lot of things better than I did. And one of the things that I didn't do well enough was be afraid to make fail or make, make mistakes. So the reason I kind of like sighed was it just, I just fucked up a lot. And, and I, but I like, then I learned from it and I, and I, and I made those mistakes. And so it's because I, and, and so, and, and, and then I learned from it. And so I kind of sighed because it's like, what happened there was I was a dumb punk kid. And no one was no one was difficult to work with. No, but I talk about this all the time. Actually, at the end of what, like we were just at TIA and and we were catching up and and uh, you know and I just I'm just you know flippantly you know talking about I, hey I was a terrible manager. I had a really really bad example as my first manager, which was no <laughs> no was terrible manager, terrible at managing people. I didn't have anybody to learn from how to be a good manager. And you know, and I said this to him and he laughs and he's like, why am I even talking? You know. And so, uh, you know, and, and he and I are very close now that we all work together. <laughs> so, so, you know, what happened? Well, you, you know, what, why, why'd that happen? Well, um, I was mad 
Um, I felt like my, my career, I've been like behind because I started, because I went to law school, right? Yeah. So even just being a freight broker made me f like, felt like failure from day one for me, given my kind of came from. I understand that. And so, you know, I thought, I thought I knew enough. I thought I knew it all. Um, I thought I could get a better situation for myself. And also like admit it, I've always been kind of entrepreneurial that I like wanted to try some things, but, um, but like I was a little bit poisoned. I had poisoned the well, you know, and all, maybe it already poisoned well, but like I kind of made that situation worse at optimal. It's one of the things I learned not to do. And, uh, and I, and I said, you know, I can go do this myself or do this better. So time I saw a trend of like shippers insourcing. So there's this, there's this trend that really happens kind of with as the market cycles move, right? Like, so we think about, oh, there's, you know, more contract freight or more spot freight or, or however shippers think about building out their routing guides for that mix, um, asset versus not asset. But the other thing that shippers really look to do, depending on what the market cycle is going, is insourcing versus outsourcing. And so you're seeing that now with like some of these, because freight was really hot for a while, now it's cooled off and they're like, oh, great. Here's a great opportunity for me to start my own in-house logistics team and insource some of that because like look at how much money we could make and also the market's a little softer so there's no yeah. money to spend on that type of initiative so i sort of identified that at the time as someone was i didn't realize it was a cycle type trend but you know i sort of saw that some of these shippers were in sourcing so i'm like let me go try and find that so i i, I partnered with a shipper who had about three million dollars in freight spend that they wanted to leverage to start an in-house brokerage and and, uh, and so I did. And so I did that for about four years or so. And, uh, you know, made a lot of mistakes along the way. And yeah, a lot of mistakes, some good stories, but a lot of mistakes. Sure. And then after Spartan Logistics, I started a tech company. Sort of tech company. So we in 2015, so this is something I deserve more credit for. Okay. You know, I have a relatively low ego guy in general, but this is something I deserve a lot more credit for. So in 2015, we started digital, 2016, we started a digital brokerage. Okay. And, you know, so Convoy had just started, Uber had just started, all of them came out like right at the same time as us. They were building an app. We were doing it with uh, what at the time, what is now called generative AI. So we did, the NLP is what, you know, uh, what, how we refer to it. But I'm actually really glad that generative AI is more of the zeitgeist now because I could, people can understand a lot more what our approach was. And so... You know, I looked at this problem and I, I was just a freight guy and I met two co-founders who were like not freight guys. You know, one of them was, a, uh, both of them were more technical, but one was like the CEO fundraiser guy. The other one was, a, you know, CTO. And, and we were kind of looking at the problem the same way. But so, you know, when I kind of looked at it, I was like, all this communication is really silent, right? So I've got my phone, I got my desk phone here. I got my cell phone here, right? Like I think about Elprin, you know, Elprin would be on his phone you know, at Echo, he'd be on two fucking phones at Echo, <laughs> you know, and then he'd be texting, you know, the, 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 you know, guy from unlimited carriers about going to pick up this, that, and the other, you know, my email's over here, the TMS is over here. None of those things talk to each other. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of missed information there. There's a lot of missed data there. And I'm like, you know, ultimately as a freight broker, a lot of what we do is just play switchboard operator. If you remember how old phone systems work, right? Like there's somebody there, they take the little plug, they plug it in over here. They're switchboard operators. That's a lot of what we do, right? We just take information from one place and we turn that system. That's right. And and if you think about it, every conversation that we have as freight brokers and as trucking companies, like in supply chain and logistics, um, you know, the first five, 10, 20 steps of the conversation are all the same. Hey, Mr. Customer, kind of, for, you know, call it, you know, I, 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 you sent me a quote for this, that, or the other, you know, let me get a little bit more information. What's the weight? What's the rate? Same thing with sourcing a truck. Hey, uh, call to see if you have anybody around Chicago, Illinois today that's a driver. And yes, great. I've got a little going to um, St. Louis. Would you be interested in something like that? Yeah. Okay, great. It's this boy, because blah, 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 blah. And so, you know, we just saw opportunities to do all that better. There's a lot of applications across the business for natural language processing. It's more than chat, obviously. But so we were looking at applying it to all of those things. And there's some really cool things that you can do um, leveraging kind of like conversations at scale, right? And so I can tell stories about some of that stuff that they might bore people, but like I ran some really cool data science related experiments around trying to identify real time market liquidity and things like that. And so um, I'm still a really big fan of natural language processing and Gen AI. I've been 
ever since I, I stopped and stopped doing that business, like I've been involved in a lot of startups that do um, NLP or Gen AI because you can use it across the business, like Vuma, for instance. In 2015, uh, text was not exactly the hot thing. No, uh, definitely not. I remember um, it was, if anything, it was like images and vision and yeah. trying to recognize rectangles. And That's right. So anybody OCR, yeah. Knows, yeah. OCR, I guess OCR was a term that was, was still up yeah. many, many it times. was still pretty nascent too but in terms of like the new age you know yeah. the wave of like at these ai models that we have now yeah it was uh it was still not in the picture the interesting thing is like the nlp so you obviously you obviously couldn't do voice i mean voice is something that's even just now getting some possible yeah but you know back then google did sort of like do this they put out this like call they had done where somebody where their ai assistant had called and scheduled a hair appointment hair yeah. You remember that? So it was right around that time. But still, it wasn't like, it was also around when Adobe had first demoed at like their, um, you know, their big, like, you know, event, Your their show. CES yeah. event thing, you know. Um, they had demoed the, the, the application that allowed you to like edit voice text, you know, and like, I do, do you recall very, that? Very, very, yeah, yeah, very, yeah. So now all those things are like kind of uh, out. But so at the time it was very text-based, right? So the interesting thing is, like, the LLMs were sufficiently good to do it. Where we fell short from a tech perspective was none of the ecosystem technology was really ready. To so, like, we had to build all of our own phone system. Because, like, where now you can use Dialpad or something else to do integrated text and voice, you know, one number, blah, blah, blah. We had to build our entire phone system off Twilio because we had to have kind of that connected ecosystem. Yep. You know, we had to build our own TMS because there was nothing that was integratable enough um, for us to get the data in and out wow. in ways that we like could drive automation off of. And so that's really where we were a little bit too early. The funny, the interesting thing is we weren't too early on the more Gen AI sure. pieces of the business. So yeah. it was cool. It was, it was, you know, I learned a lot there. I made a lot of mistakes there too from like a business perspective and, and, uh, and so that yeah, so then I started a tech company. Okay. And then uh, and then about five years ago I joined Ventura. Okay. And back then it was called Care Direct. That's right. Back then it was called Care Direct. I think yeah. that's when I met you for this time. That's right. It's still called it was still Care called Care Direct. Care Direct. Yeah, Care Direct. Yeah. yeah. And the story behind Care Direct is that the founder of Project Forty Four. That's right. What's his name? Jet. Jet. Jack McCandless. Uh -huh. McCandless. Yeah. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. McCandless. Okay. I assume. He started he it. Said, yeah, yeah. Started, <laughs> I assume that he's right. Yeah. He he started it right, Care yeah. Direct, and then he went on on to do Project Forty Four. Yeah, that's right. And then he got Peter uh, Rentschler yeah. to be the the CEO, right? Yeah. So Care Direct started as actually a very different business than it is today. So Jet Jet had been at Yellow Freight. I think Yellow. Uh, no, he was at uh, Global Trans. No, well, so before okay. Global Trans, I think he was at Yellow. He was okay. Like a senior, like a sure. like a VP of Sales or Regional Sales Manager or something like that. And then this guy, um, Brad Berlin, who was with us for a long time, who's at FreightCleans.com now. Shout out, Brad. Boop. That's uh, right. Love Brad. Uh, so they were both global, early global trans folks. So Brad was like the COO. He, he's like a dyed-in-the-wool LTL guy also. He helped build some of the early technology, like some of the early global trans technology. Anyway, so they, they got, you know, they left global trans and they started care. So care, the reason it was called care direct. So most 3PLs, even now, um, you know, the smaller mid-market 3PLs, they can't go to a carrier and get rates set up, right? They go through an Echo for Echo ship or a DLS Worldwide or something like that, you know, Blink Race, and they resell those rates. And so what, what Brad and, and Jet would do is they would go to these regional LTL carriers, you know, the second tier regionals, mm -hmm. and they would do a network analysis, help the carrier figure out where they need more density, and then go to 3PLs and help them get the rates set up directly. So they'd help the 3PLs go carrier direct. <laughs> um, uh, they hired a guy named uh, Joel Club, And Joel is now the COO of Worldwide Express. Uh -huh. um, and so they hired this guy, Joel, who came you know, from Accenture, like a traditional consulting background. And the three of them were sort of like doing this for a while. And, and, uh, and then, um, yeah, Project 44 started as like kind of a... Um, like a, 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 a brain closet project for Jet. Joel got recruited away to be the CEO of Worldwide. And so uh, at that point, like kind of customers had been like, hey, you're doing this analysis. You clearly have people who know the industry. Can you help us figure out how to make our business better? Can you help us figure out what to do with technology, whatever? So it naturally evolved into 
uh, to consulting from where yeah. I was. And, uh, and so, um, he hired Peter to backfill, um, to backfill, uh, uh, uh Joel. Okay. And then, and then he left a new project 44 and now like they're not involved in the business anymore at all. Sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, so. And when did you enter the picture? I entered the picture about five. So they started the business in 2010 or 11. Peter, I think joined in like 15 or 16. And then I joined in 19. Uh, I joined it. 19? The very beginning of 19? Five years ago. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I know, right? Fucking just. Yeah. Christ. The before times seem like yeah. forever ago, but also like not that long ago. The before COVID The times. before yeah. times. I just, I just straight up refer to it as the before times. Yeah. 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 So I joined in about 2015 and I was burnt out, man, from being like, from doing these like, you know, kind of earlier stage companies, like building these businesses and, yeah. and like, you know, having success, but also having failure and like, well, you're. When you're an entrepreneur, I mean, you've experienced this, Paul, like it can be really lonely. Like you don't have, you don't, even if you have like a network and I don't have the, I didn't have the networks then that I have now, but like, you know, you're running your business by yourself, if you will. Like when you're at the top, like there's no, you know, if you don't have the right, um, you know, you can build this out and, and create a different environment for yourself. But I didn't know how to do that. Again, something I didn't know how to do when it failed. Like I didn't have anybody that I could really talk to or offboard some of this stuff or, or you know, or, 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 uh, so I was pretty, so I was like, I just want to be a guy. And so I'm like, I just want to be a guy. So Peter brought me, you know, Peter, Peter and I met and, uh, and he's like, you know, and I picked, I had a couple of things I was kind of like deciding between, but I just didn't want to do another. I, I was like, I'm not going to do another shot up right now. And, um, and I just want to be a guy. And Peter, Peter had the best opportunity for me and, and I'm super. Super. I mean, my job's a fuck all days. I need to buy Uh So I definitely cannot complain. So it's been a great ride, but you know that lasted. Me wanting to be a guy lasted maybe like two months, and I'm like, all right, I'll do, I'll do other stuff too. You know, it's a, uh, it's been, sure. been a wild ride. That's cool. Um, Chris, you got to. I mean, seems seems basically just like you need that two month period to like re kind of find yeah. your energy again, and then yeah. once you got once you got back yeah. to the settles. Also, just when I see opportunities, like I can't help but work on them. I'm just kind of like that. Sure. Guy, you know, so yeah, Was, and, go. Go ahead. I was gonna. I was just gonna ask maybe a little bit of switch topic, but on topic to the things that we we're talking about LP, I'm you know LLMs earlier. Yeah. What do you see right now tech wise? Uh, that's inter- that's been like you get up in the morning, and you're like still thinking about this stuff. I mean, uh, obviously, Gen AI is exciting. True. I think a lot about you. People are really missing the point on Gen AI a lot, I think, oh, and like that. what it can do, and like NLP and what it can do. Um, I wrote an article for Three PL Perspectives, the TIA magazine, back in October that was like, "Hey, like you're there's a lot of talk about AI right now. But like you're kind of most of you aren't ready for AI. So, but here's an AI you can use right now. Um, I think people are like way over indexed on the generative part of generative AI, like it can reach out to people and do things or it can take inbound and then automate or like react, if you will. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities that people are sort of like missing the boat on. But I mean, since I've loved NLP and generative AI for, for quite some time, I'm obviously very excited there. But um, I think that there are, so there are really cool things um, that people are are working on there. I'm really excited about the voice applications of gen AI. Um, I think that, uh, I think that people are, are missing the boat on a lot of like where in the operating model of a logistics company or broker or or trucking company or whatever you can leverage these things. It's all a lot of front of the house applications. Like there's a ton you can do with back of the house. That's like a lot safer. Um, so I think there's a lot that I'm excited about, but also I think that there's just, there's a little bit of a, I'm, I'm also a little bit down on freight tech right now in that, like, I do think that a lot of folks are missing sort of the boat on like the big, the big why, like what, what problem are you trying to solve? So I'm not super, uh, well informed or truly about the inner workings of EDI and all how it works. But the one thing EDI? that I, EDI, yeah. but one thing that I have been trying to learn a little bit more about is how a lot of the industry is dependent on EDI yeah. to basically inter- interchange. Yeah. And everybody that I talked to, I don't think I've ever heard a single person that said they like EDI or yeah. the, the way that it's implemented, used, and so forth. Um, have you seen 
or thought about at all maybe how any of these um, L- large language models, these LLMs, um, may provide a new uh, new medium for communication and exchange between companies because every company yeah. has their own format and structure of data, right? An API, whatever it might be. And um, and the difficult part has always been getting that information from one party to the other. Sure. Right? Or at least the setup of it. So, so I think like you have to understand why EDI is so sticky. Like everybody's sort of like, oh, let's get rid of EDI. Let's go. But the reason EDI is sticky is that is that shippers have really complex technology ecosystems. You know, a freight broker has a really simple tech tech ecosystem. Like you have a TMS and you have some other shit with it. You know, a carrier has a much a little bit more complicated, but largely still simple. You have a TMS, an ERP. I guess you have an ERP for uh, you know financial accounting for uh, for broker as well. But you know, a, a shipper has a true TMS, a true ERP. You know, a true OMS. Like they have all of these systems. So to turn that ship is really freaking difficult. And so that's part of the reason that EDI is so sticky is that like it's not. It's easy for them to make a change in that stat. And so I would say that there's two possible ways that I think that, uh, that I, that I see, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it, uh, but there's two possible things that I would say. The first is a big problem with EDI is mappings, right? And like, and so I do think that, and we're actually, so we have a managed integrations offering at Metaphora. Uh, so Metaphora is a consulting, a tech consulting, this industry. Uh, and so we, uh, we have administrators. Over, and so we're using, uh, we're using these LLMs to help us with, uh, with mappings, both EDI, API doesn't matter, but to be able to kind of like ingest, you know, both the sort of like inbound and the target and then, and then, and then learn, you know, learn to be able to, and be able to do the mapping. So, I do think that in the large, that that's one way it can help um, along those lines as well. A big problem with EDI is no matching. So I got an inbound, uh, you know, whatever it might be, two fourteen or or you know or or nine ninety or whatever, whatever the whatever the the the, oh. the the message might be, but it didn't match to anything in my system. Okay, well, like, is this for me? Is it not for me? Like, can this is you know, if it is for me, where should this have been? Uh, cause it's maybe missing the an essential field, but it has a bunch of other information. So being able to parse those messages and then, and then automate some of that. The other, like, this is, this is not exactly related to what you described, but tangential, no matter what the tech ecosystem is, people always engage with humans outside of the system. So an example like, you know, of what we were working on at, at my last business, right? So I had a customer and I tell the story somewhat frequently. So, so fast forward, if you've already heard the story, uh, you know, I had a customer who, uh, he called me every, they had a TMS. We have a TMS. Uh, we didn't have an integration, but even if we had an integration, I guarantee this would have played itself out the same way. So he would call me every morning and he would say, are we good on our loads today? And I'd say, yeah, Willie, we're going to load. So I was like, hey, man, I have a TMS. I can give you a login or a new generation, whatever. You can go in. You can see the carrier. You can see blah, blah, blah. Call me every. I gave him the login. Never logged in. He'd call me every. So then I started automating a report to him. Went into his email. Had the carrier. It had the load. It had the blah, blah, blah. Had ETA to pick up. Still, still called me every morning. So I started automating an email that went out to him that said, hey, Willie, we're good on our load today. Dude, stop calling. <laughs> and so... The question is why, right? Like what, why did he stop calling? Cause I actually gave him less information, right? It didn't have the carrier's names. It didn't have, the reason is because he believed rightly that I had contextual knowledge, institutional knowledge, tribal knowledge, context, but I had knowledge in context of any shipment that's not captured in a way that's digestible to him that I would tell him otherwise. Yes. This car- this load has a carrier assigned, but is that carrier getting empty at a CNS ten you know twenty five miles away with a you know a delivery appointment of eleven a.m. when I pick up at two p.m. so it's going to be tight, and if he bounces, I'm not going to find another. Tr- Those are the kind of things that he trusted that I would have 
figure out. That I would that I would circus to him. And so, well, what happens with EDI, API, whatever? It's not even when do those things break down. It's when do I want more? What do I want to know more? When is there context that's necessary? Tracking was a good example. I like to refer to the track, like kind of more than the blue dot is visibility. What we have today is real-time tracking, meaning, you know, the blue dot moves across the stream, across the, across the screen. But like, I see that a driver's at a delivery facility and he's been there for 90 minutes. Is that a problem? I don't know. If dude's got a green light and he's getting his paperwork, no. If, you, if dude if doesn't even have a door yet, then yeah, possible problem. And, and so, but you have to engage with those the same way. And integration doesn't help with that, right? So you still have to do something else. You still have to reach out or and you can do that through automation, right? You can do it through types of automation today, but chat specifically, um, it can, can help with that. Um, and then just other types of, and so like any area where you might have to engage with a person along those lines, when integrations break down. Okay, so now I've got an automated detention notification you know, I got an EDI, you know, I got an EDI tracking update, but like, what am I going to do with that? You know, okay, I have to, I have to do, I have to use some other logic and then do something with that. And so I think that's a way that, that, that NLP and LLMs can definitely make a difference as it relates to kind of like, as a touch them on EDI. Interesting. Kind of like the, the freight tech nerds nerding out here. Yeah. That little bit. Paul's like, like fucking, like, like we're going to have to cut all. <laughs> no one's going to watch this. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk a little bit yeah, about, no yeah, yeah, I got a mic together. Um, so you own the domain. Uh, I own a lot of domains, but yeah, which one? About TMS. Friends don't let friends TMS. Oh, friends don't let friends. I love that. Uh, TMS. It's dot, it was dot org because it's a nonprofit. It's a nonprofit. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. And when did you uh, buy that domain? Probably like 2019 or so. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, and then on top of that, you post frequently on LinkedIn. And lately I've seen this trend and I just want to bring on my phone and I want to read out your, your LinkedIn posts and kind of get your thoughts on what you've been, uh, you know. My thoughts on what I've had to say. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Exactly. I think that guy sounds really smart. That's my thought, you know. That guy knows a thing or two about a thing or two. I got to get my internet set up. But overall, you've had a trend on LinkedIn where you say, I don't know who needs to hear this. I don't know who needs to hear this. And then you, you go off. Um, Curious as to, I mean, I'm going to read one right here. Okay, this was posted yesterday. I don't know who needs to hear this, but like, would you go to a casino and play a game that has 1 in 20 ads, but plays 10 to 1 and has a 10K minimum? That's what you're doing when you don't train people as new hires on new technology and advanced concepts to take the careers to the next level or on how to be leaders. You can win 100K, but you're spending 20K to do it. 200K? You wrote 220K. Okay, well, then I need to fix that. <laughs> you're making about an every employee at every stage of their career and with every new initiative and you're losing the battle over and over the yeah. stakes go up further wait, go up the further on they are yeah. so um any comments? that's a dense one yeah look i mean this industry buys shit they hire people and they just like think it's going to take care of itself and, and they're like, well, you know, and, and it's like, well, I figured it out. Somebody else will too. Or like our high performers figure it out. Or like, if it was that easy to use the technology, for instance, like people would just be able to figure it out. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I guess, but like, do you just, like you're just lighting money on fire. And so, you know, what I'm getting at is like, you're making up every time you do something in your business, you're making a bet. You hire somebody, you like, don't. Doesn't it make sense to try and do what you can to make that bet successful? Mostly, so for instance, you know, most leaders, I talk about, you know, leadership development in there and training. Like, to the extent that anybody does any training, it's pretty much like new hire training. Congratulations, welcome to the industry. Here's a bunch of shit you'll never need to know. And a little bit of shit you're going to need to know, but maybe not know for like six months, six years. And another, like a little bit of shit you need to know right now. And then like, goodbye. Yeah. figure it out on the floor and then they wonder like why the company struggles to get off booking a bunch of loads on fucking that like I got an idea it's been because you did a shitty job training your people and then by the way they get on the floor and they just see like the way it's actually done quote unquote in your business yeah um, and so 
you know, you're making a bet every turn. The way that people become managers or leaders, they just happen to be good at their job. Like, or, or in my case, we're bad at their job, but just like happen to be in the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you're betting that that's going to work out. And what you're, you know, you're, you're one of my good friends. He was a high performer, high performing sales guy at Access America, but he was like two weeks away from getting fired. And then he just figured it out, you know, another guy, same, same story at CH Robinson, you know, Chicago Central, like he would, he was, he was making three, $400,000 a year at 25 years old. But like when he started, he was just figuring it out and they had really good training, right? But they didn't, they didn't continue. They didn't invest in like sort of more of the uh, advanced training concepts or whatever. And so, you know, you buy technology and you're just like, Hey, we're going to like have to just implement it on the fly. Or like, we're going to train people as we go. You know, if you don't, you're, you're making a bet that that's going to work and you're actually, and, and a lot of times you're, you're sort of saying like, well, we can't afford to do this or can't afford to do that. What you're missing is like, you're actually spending the money one way or the other. So like, if you're hiring people and you're not effectively training them, your managers aren't, aren't effective as leaders and managers to get the most out of people. If you're not investing in upskilling them on concepts as they go, like selling sports selling contract bait versus spot freight or, or, or carrier development versus carrier booking. Like you're just, then you just hire more people than you need. You just end up hiring more people or you fire good people that could have been high performers and are hiding in plain sight. And so, you know, that's, that's a big part of what I'm driving at there is like, you're spending the money one way or the other and you're making a bet. And it's a losing bet the way that you're doing it right now. And you're actually spending more money than you're getting. So you're spent, you could win a hundred cat. But you're spending 200k to get that 100k. That math doesn't make sense. But you, the 100k is easy to measure because you can see it. Like you go to the window and you cash in the ticket, and I got 100k. But like the 200k is the like you just keep feeding money into the machine. Yeah. You keep feeding money into the you know the slot machine, and you're pulling the thing. It's it's a lot harder to see that you did that. You know. Yeah. So like the takeaway here is like slow down a bit, figure out like the training process, the processes that you want your company to have and actually make sure you're, you're training your people instead of just like being on the fly. So like it's, it's, it's invest, it's invest in things that are going to make you successful, that are going to make whatever decision you made successful. So if you're going to hire people, train them. If you're going to have staff at all, continue to train them after new hire training. If you're going to take a technology initiative on, be willing to make changes to your business that are going to make it successful. If you buy, if you buy a pricing, if you if you buy green screens as a sponsor, right? Yeah. You go and buy green screens. Shout out green screens. Shout, Shout out, out Dog, <laughs> Kevin, the crew. If you're going to buy green screens, and uh, and and you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna use it to to help your reps automate or excuse me help help your your reps price. Make sure that they understand the platform, like in how it works. If you're going to buy a digital digital booking platform of some sort and you're not going to like you're not going to change the way that you manage your load board or that your reps are compensated you're not willing to make other changes in your business to make the most out of this it's more than just training to make the most out of whatever it is you're going to do don't fucking do it because you're just going to waste the money you're just wasting the money you know what are the problems that you're trying to solve and then how are you investing in those if you invest in your people you invest in the technology you have to invest in your business be make the changes and actually you're right slow down and then actually be willing to do the things at some level you have to tell people hey your job is going to change and yeah that might create consternation but i'm going to you know but 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 we're going to make these other changes that make this worth it for you or sure it might be. yeah you slow down now to then go be able to go faster later that's right and actually get yeah. the success that you're looking for or the yeah. value you're looking for right definitely yeah I, i've been Rereading the book Traction lately, and you know, okay, it's like the entrepreneurial operating system ELS by Gino Wickman, and he like essentially says like, if you don't have your like internal structure like the company figured yeah. out yet, like figure that out first. Take the year or two just to figure out your internal structures, your processes, yeah. your core values, your 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 vision structure, uh, and then once once you have that all in place, then you could take over the market, and you're going to be a much yeah. better company totally after you do that. Um, Okay, so that was one LinkedIn post. Kind of, I kind of want to dig deeper in here because yeah. there's a lot of golden nuggets, like asking you to actually caption your LinkedIn, yeah, explain your post. Yeah, 
Also, oh. like change any typos oh. that might be in there. Yeah. <laughs> I love this one. I'm, I'm here. checking Ryan. All right, this one, this one's gonna be good. I don't know who needs to hear this, but those brokers you have who majored in communications, oh, yeah. quote unquote, <laughs> got a C in macroeconomics. You needed an extra credit for that B minus in algebra sophomore year of high school. Are better than a computer at pricing because they've been doing it for twenty years. Yeah. It's called confirmation bias. So, <laughs> also shout out green screen because um, this one's about pricing. You know, it's interesting because. We go into these businesses and they there's this sort of like interesting duality that exists, which is like, we're not good enough. We need more, we need better, we need whatever. Also, but our people are great at all of these things that we can't possibly like, and a computer could never be better and automation could never work and blah, blah, blah. And like, Pricing is a great example of this because it's just one example, but pricing is a great example of this, which is a lot of the concepts that we ask freight brokers to be really good at actually require very complex reasoning, understanding, you know, uh, analysis to be truly good at them. Pricing required, like, so, you know, the reason that people, and I, and I was one of these people, I was like, I'm good at pricing. Well, how do you know you're good at pricing? Because I win a lot of freight and I make money winning it. And it's like, but that's confirmation. That's, that's backwards. Like, right. Like, so I know what ended up happening, but I don't know. That doesn't mean that I got there um, effectively, right? I can backwards justify it. It's imputed correctness because I did win the freight, but that doesn't mean it was the right price. I mean, it was it was a right price, but not the right price. You know, pricing and how pricing moves is macroeconomics. It's um, it's microeconomics. It's a ton of things that go into what the strike price is, who's going to move it, and and what and more importantly, kind of like what the impact is at the bottom line of this. So when we talk about pricing or think about pricing, we actually talk about the cost of the truck or the price to the customer. But how is this carrier impacting or this customer impacting our cost to serve or cost to operate? How much, there's a, every single one of these businesses has a ton of freight that is unprofitable. And they'd fight you tooth and nail on that concept to say, absolutely not. I charged the customer 1150, I paid the truck 1100, I made 150 bucks. You, however, you know, you had to call for an appointment to pick up, you had to call for an appointment to delivery, those things never match up. So then you have to call back for a different pickup. You have to, you always have to reach out to the customer to change the fucking PO number, blah, 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 blah. And it ended up taking somebody three hours to get this load ready to be booked. That person's making, you know, $50,000 a year. Well, that's $75 off the rip. Okay. And then it was a tough load. We had to really grind it out. It took a carrier rep two hours to book that load. And that guy's making $50,000 a year. Well, that's another $50. Now I've just spent $125 on this load. And I haven't even tracked it yet. I haven't even billed it or collected it yet. You know, there are so many of those things that impact cost. And so, but yet, and yet, like, we think a rep can just, like, know the business. And it's absurd. And, like, it's, it's, it, you're asking them to do really hard math. And, like, okay, so, yes, it is hard. So how could, you know, how can we build the right algorithms? I mean, I'm just... If Uber can figure out fucking search pricing and how to how to price dynamically ride share with millions of transactions going on at the same time, right? An algorithm can be better at pricing than your carrier rep who's done it for five years, ten years, six years, twenty five, thirty years. Travis did hire a nuclear physicist as one of his like t first five hires. I right. think though, so maybe brokerages need to hire. Nuclear well, yeah. no, brokerage, like sometimes brokers need to outsource it, right? Like free screen. But the, 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 the focus should be not on automating right away. Like, so to be clear about this, the answer isn't go from zero to one in the context of go from like on have no one price anything or have, have humans price everything to implicitly trust an algorithm. There are so, there's so much data that's lost. When I walk into these, Companies broke. The, I just think about how much data gets lost. So now I'll tell you a story that's an example of some of this data that I, that I talk about. Cool data science. So, so 
one of the benefits like really big brokers have is they can have like a real time picture of liquidity in a market, right? So Coyote has, Echo has, you know, et cetera, has a bunch of carrier reps on the phone talking to carriers all day. Where are your trucks today? Where are your trucks tomorrow? Blah, 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 blah. And so in very short order, they have real time picture of liquidity in the market. That's information they can use to measure price elasticity, right? And so price elasticity, for those of you following along at home, right, is how much stretch, like elastic band, how much stretch is there in pricing? How much can we kind of flex pricing up or down? And, uh, and some of that's personal preference, right? Some of that is like smelling blood in the water. This, care, this, this customer is desperate to get this load off the, off the dock. So they specifically have more price elasticity right now than other. But so one of the things I was able to do with generative AI was reach out to like a, a random sampling of 40 carriers that I expected to have move a lane. Not that it moved it for me before, but that I had data to suggest they moved. And I would just ask them if they had capacity in that, at that origin or destination that day. And just the delta in their response rates, it didn't matter what they said. They could tell me to go fuck myself. They could ask me who I am. They could say yes. Didn't matter. Just the delta in response rates would tell me what the picture, what the liquidity was in any given market. And then I could use that to measure price elasticity. So step number one is just you need to get things away from being tribal or institutional knowledge and make them measurable. So one time, this was this was not what we were doing, um, Create AI, which was the which was the digital brokerage. But, you know, I, I'm sitting there one day. We I had a bu- at Spartan. I had a bunch of freight out of Miami every day, and one day, like I'm sitting there and I just turn to our customer. You know, I, I'm like, I turn to our carrier reps and I'm like, produce is over. I'm like, produce is over. We're slashing our rates back down to where they should be. Like, and they're like, you're fucking nuts, man. Yesterday we had to pay two seventy five a mile up. I'm like, produce is over. I'm telling you, cut the rates, whatever. And I was right. And how was I right? Dumb fucking luck. But like, well, how, why would I, <laughs> but like if, but if I was one of these, like your, you know, your, your guy from, um, the cut real quick. What's that? What? Cut. Hey there, amazing listeners. If you're enjoying what you're hearing in our podcast, we need your support. It will only take a moment, but it would mean the world to us. Please make sure to hit the like button on this video, subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to share with one of your friends that would enjoy our content. Your engagement helps us reach more people and bring more awesome episodes to you. Thanks a million, and thanks for being part of the podcast community. So, you know, it was dumb luck, right? But if I was going to, you know, the way you would justify it in as it related to my LinkedIn post of like, oh, you know, because we can look back and we can see the right answer. The right answer is I had a feeling. And that feeling stemmed from, I don't know, I just kind of felt like, the phone had one more call into it <laughs> when we posted it yeah. first thing in the morning. Phones didn't blow up. It was just incremental difference. Sure. And so, but you can measure that. You can measure that with real data and you can measure that. So the delta in response rates on my text was 7%. So it was the difference between 30% responsiveness and 37% response rate, right? So small, a small delta. And it was in like the first three minutes of having sent out the message. So, you know, hard for a human to perceive you're going to be as wrong as you are you're going to be wrong when you're just like going off a field you're going to be wrong a lot more than you're right i like to play roulette every time i walk into a roulette every time i walk into a casino black 29 is my main number so if you're playing black 29 throw it down for me you know if you're ever if you're playing roulette throw it down for your boy but like <laughs> you know i remember every time i walked up to a table and think i'm gonna throw 20 i'm gonna throw 20 bucks down on 29 and it hits i forget every time i walk into the table and i said I'm going to throw up $20 on Black Twitter, and it didn't hit, right? That's confirmation bias. And so you, were, you forget all the times that you said produce is over and you're wrong, and you ended up playing three sure. grand because you were waiting for that 85 cents a mile trough. But, you know, you remember every single time when you woke. And so that's the difference. So step one is, you know, is, is certainly like partner with somebody like Green Screens or something to that effect. But if you're going to try and build some of this yourself or any of the things you're trying to do with, with AI, you need a ton of data. So focus on getting, you know, you need to focus on capturing all of the information and the data you need. And it might be as simple as just how many times the phone rang, right? Like, and it's stuff like that that you don't realize can be impactful in making a lot of these decisions. So that's what I mean. Like, I'm sorry, but you're just, no one in your business is a, is a, is a nuclear physicist. <laughs> they are not as good. I mean, Green Screens has 40 something data scientists. Like, I'm sorry, your guy sitting there in the back corner who's been pricing for 20 years does not, is not better than an algorithm at pricing. He'll be right sometimes when the algo is wrong. 
you know, one of the things is we measure, we measure human performance and technological performance differently. This is a huge problem. And this is something I want to talk about. Yes. What I want to talk about, I want to talk about this. Okay. We measure human performance on a standard of better. I am a better freight broker than the two of you. Like I am. License. You know, that's debatable. We could actually, know. we could test this out in a second. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> like, you know, but, but like, or, or you are better today than you were yesterday. Right. Like, so the improvement or right or, or comparative, it's, it's all comparative and it's a standard of better. Have you gotten better over time? Are you better than the person next to you? Whatever. We measure technology on a perfect scale. Did you get this right every single fucking time? Here's a, perfect, here's a great example of that is like autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicle gets into a fender bender when it's on autonomous mode. Is that on the nightly news? Absolutely it is. When was the last time that a fender bender was on the news when two human drivers were driving? Not, right? What makes it on the news is this idiot is the worst driver in America and is worse than the people around it because we perform yep. because it's on a better statement. And the same is true in this context, right? If you measure a person against an algorithm, the person is wrong more than the algorithm is wrong. But the algorithm is going to be wrong. It's going to be less wrong than the people, mm-hmm. and it's going to be more right than the people. To that point, Tesla Autopilot is like if you drive on it, it's statistically more. It's already statistically more safe. Significantly. But if you get if you get into an accident, well, it's like from the center. To be honest, like you turned on autopilot yesterday. That's uh, it's full self. And we almost got an accident like five times. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I knew what I was doing. I knew yeah. what I was doing. Like this, yeah. you know what to expect. But that's like the, we have the. I, I think the expectation grid. is actually important, right? Like what do you expect of the algorithm? That's right. And like I know that on the highway, I can expect it to actually perform much better. At, but then like in the down oh, the street, yeah. Area, yeah, I'm already expecting that. Like I'm just yeah. curious, like. Is this going to make it like right. across the intersection? Right. So that, that's different. But I'm, I, I get the point. Yeah. But it's still, I mean, it's a question of better versus, again, it's still a question of better versus, um, versus, uh, versus perfect. Yeah. And like, I actually think that Chris is bringing up a good point. You guys are bringing up a really good point, which is like, better may also look different than it has looked before. Like, we're not comparing, you know, how Tesla drives on autopilot. It may drive differently than a human would drive or does drive. Was the outcome better? What are we, what are we measuring, right? We shouldn't be measuring. So when we do, like one of the, my other, I don't know who needs to hear this was, something to the effect of like, I don't know who needs to hear this, but like you're focusing too much on automating things that don't work. Mm-hmm. If you want, like all you're doing is automating bad things at scale. I had a high school basketball coach who said, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. If you automate something that's not working, you are just doing the wrong thing at scale, yeah. right? And so, am I actually trying to make it look like what we do now, or am I trying to make it look different? And so, it may actually, you may have gotten into an accident five times, almost gotten into an accident five times, or just may have seemed like that. I don't, I don't know that this is the case. <laughs> sure, But sure. I was arguing, it may have seemed like that because it just didn't react the way that you would have reacted. And that's one of the things that goes into what the right answer is so like is the output right not did it get there the same way you would get there okay you dig i dig it yeah yeah, yeah. i dig i love that just a fun thought experiment but like they're actually trying that is tesla they're trying to imitate now at scale right from millions of miles of driving data imitate how humans drive and now at least from i haven't experienced it personally but supposedly from what people are saying in line they're actually using the terminology better like right. as in as the versions improve, they're saying right, it's better and better. So because they're trying to condition people, yeah. Like that is, that's more about how do you get people to adopt, and that's an interest. I mean, it's definitely an interesting challenge, right? Yeah. Adoption was an interesting challenge, and when you can't force adoption, you know, you have to like you have to show people a better. You have to show you have to condition them to, like the commercials you see about personal injury. They're not so much about soliciting customers, although they are. They're about conditioning a jury pool when they get up there like, oh, aren't these trucks really scary? Aren't they so scary? Imagine it was you and your family that was involved in this wreck. Like, who gives a shit that the guy was drunk and driving, you know, that the four-wheeler was drunk and he was driving the wrong way on the highway. He never, and, you know, that driver was, par- that driver shouldn't have been parked there. And if he wasn't parked there, this guy would have crashed into a light pole and died. But like, we, but so what? It's about conditioning the jury to be afraid of so- it's lizard brain shit, bro. They have books on this. It's fucking <laughs> mind blowing. But so yeah, it's about conditioning people. Go ahead. What's up? I'm curious because um, I think you know Chad Olson quite well. Yeah, I was gonna say, have you had him on? 
I don't even have you it. Gotta have, you should have chat on. Okay. I actually want to bring up his LinkedIn post that he posted reflecting on his time at TIA. And then I also want to hear your thoughts on TA because TIA, we were just here last week. Yeah. All of us were. Shout out to Radio Station and the Media Association. Yeah. Shout out to TIA. Uh, so this is what Chad wrote. Reflecting on my time at TIA, AI is fake news. Yeah. There's a bigger opportunity to consolidate freight tech versus consolidating the transportation market. Yeah. 3PLs have adopted too much new tech, which has driven their costs per load too high. There are some new leaders in freight who are absolutely crushing. It's an employer's market, which means that you need to take care of your people. It's won't last forever. Yeah. There are extremely smart leaders for operating that the market will never rebound. And yep. then that low volume, awesome. high, vo- high margin days are, are dead. Um, so curious. Okay. So first let's touch on the point. AI is fake news. Do you agree with that? I guess I'm the, saying, I definitely know, but no, yeah. but what I agree with what Chad is actually getting at, cause Chad and I have had this conversation and what he's suggesting is the deployments. So there are certainly technology companies today that are talking about doing things with AI that are, that, that are not actually like AI, which like at a manner of speaking, that's just like you're, you're splitting hairs. Like we were talking about OCR, optical, optical character recognition. That's not AI, but at the same time, like, so, like, you know, if, you're, if it's leveraging OCR versus, you know, versus, I mean, NLP, you know, if you, if you have an NLP use case, it has to, it's to start with it. It's built on top of OCR also, but like, but there are, there are certainly companies that are talking about doing AI ML that aren't or what have you, that are just doing from statistical regression models or what have you. His point is that the deployments of AI today in the space are largely fake news, which I concur in part by the sense in part, but like would be a whole podcast in and of itself. <laughs> sure. Okay. But I largely agree with the fourth thing. Oh, is smoke and mirrors for sure. Like yeah, that's right. Teams are just using that terminology. To that's right. That's right. Front. It's marketing. That's right. Definitely. What's number two? There's a bigger opportunity to consolidate freight tech versus consolidating the transportation market. Yeah. So that's also one that I would say, if you asked him, he would say that I... That, that he stole from me didn't steal from me as such but like he and i were actually talking the other day about he texted me and he we were talking about something or whatever but he said you know he thinks consolidation is coming hardcore and i don't and the reason i don't think consolidation is coming to tnl um particularly like truckload is you know there are 150 or so shippers that make the market and they know that fragmentation is good for them, so they won't let fragmentation happen. And you see it all the time at M and A in the truckload space, right? Company A buys, you know, Company A has fifty million dollars in spend from whatever shipper. Company B has seventy-five million dollars in spend from that shipper. I'm using fake numbers, obviously. And the late overlap is almost nothing, so you assume that they're going to get one hundred twenty-five million. The our next RFP cycle comes out, and they don't. Like, of course they don't, because the, the shippers don't want consolidation to happen. Just look at like the operating ratios of like parcel, rail, LTL, and truckload. Operating ratio is how much of the dollar in revenue you take to the bottom line, right? And so in inverse order, you know, parcels at like 40, you know, 40 or so OR, rails at 60 or something, LTLs at 80, and, and, and TLs in the upper 90s. And the reason, it, and, and so that tells you, right, how much money it costs. And and so they're make the lower the number, the more money that company's making in profit, right? And consolidation, DHL and FedEx, UPS, who the fuck else? You know, right? Like rail, there's, you know, what, five class one railroads and and you know, a handful of class two railroads or whatever it is. You know, and then LTL, there's fifty or so providers. Truckload, there's hundreds of thousands. Yeah. And so, you know, that is not going to that that I don't think is ever going to happen in in trucking. I mean, look, I mean, AB InBev could give all of their freight to CH Robin and say CH Robinson and save more money this year, but they're not going to because again, it's giving them look look pricing power. Freight tech, I agree because again, like a lot of these companies are working on a lot of these companies, I think are working on the wrong thing. But even to the extent that they are working on the right thing, too many of them are are working on too narrow of a use case to be useful across an enterprise so like if you're working on like load entry automation for instance that's great but like i have a bunch of places where i have docs in my business you know and so what are you going to do for appointment scheduling what are you going to do for and because all of those are documents in the manner of and what am i going to do for like you know pod management or invoice creation or what have you so i can see i see consolidation there just being like you know having more meaningful 
uh, having a product that can solve a problem, but meaningfully across the use case in the business. Okay. So I agree with that. Is it, would you view that as a, a larger, a larger solution or if you were able to make a deeper product, solution, not a larger step, like, right. I would imagine a little bit, maybe longer time to get to market with, or do you deploy in increments? Like it's small, like if you were to start, you know, start up doing one of these very tech, um, solutions, like, yeah, would you build, build, build without maybe getting customer? No, never. Yeah. No, no, no. It's more about going, it's more about having something that's deep enough to solve enough problems. But no, I don't think you have to solve the entire problem all at once. But again, like, so I think just talking about, you know, when he's talking about consolidation, it's like you have somebody who's working on this part, somebody who's working on this part, somebody who's working on this part. They're going to grow towards each other or what have you. And so, you know, one of them just buy the other one, you know, Got what it. have you. So, but no, I mean, I agree. Like get things into the market, test them against customers, et cetera. Have you been around enough freight tech M&A to know whether or not like, consolidation of tech stacks actually works does it actually work yeah like in, in yeah because I, I know that like consolidating I bet that, well it depends stacks. on what we're talking about yeah, a little like, bit no, like it, that is definitely a challenge like if you're talking about when you're talking about consolidation of like a TMS market you know we have a in a TMS space that's a lot harder you know but if you're talking about like if you're talking about something like you know some of the NLP application or some of the AI ML sorry LLM um, generative AI stuff that we're talking about, really you're buying like the, the model you having been sure fun. So it kind of depends. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Let's do a podcast on that. So that would be cool. Let's do a tech, let's do a, like a free tech podcast, you and me, yeah. and we'll just fucking nerd out on it. I didn't know. Yeah, we, well, we won't bother. Won't bother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paul's, like, Paul's like, I'm talking. I, we, can like, call, I, we can call it the Freight Nerd Podcast. He's like, I immediately <laughs> regret having Ryan in this. And Chad will do it with us. You, me, and Chad, we can do cool. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I just don't belong in that. I, uh, but. Okay. What was the what, third one? There was third one was there are some new leaders in freight who are absolutely crushing. Yeah, that's just yeah, that's true. Another okay. Yeah. Um, but okay, I mean, I don't know if there's any a few. See, we don't have to do. That. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. What were you, what were your takeaways from TIA? I agree. Like you know, I'm just uh, the the technology thing is a good one. I mean, I, I'm really like I said, I'm disillusioned by um, where sort of like freight tech is right now. I think there's a lot to be excited about but i think some of these things are pointed in the wrong direction um i think think that's been true for a while um so i'm like i'm i I, i'm hopeful that i'm hopeful that things uh, change uh the market is definitely a challenge still for folks um i've thought that the market i've I've sort of thought that this this quote-unquote rate recovery was going to be somewhat more muted than like what we've seen coming out of the last few um, rate recessions. And I think that's what it looks like. Um, and so, but that, that's what it continues to kind of like, or, or that's sort of playing itself out. Um, but I also, it seems like folks are in a place where they, they know they can't just sit around and wait for that to like, wait for it to just be transformationally better. Like they can't wait until it gets to the top. Like they've been sitting around for a year and a half. In a lot of a lot of senses, they've right sized their business, or they're um, they know that there are areas of opportunity in their business uh, today to like have improvement. A lot of those are going to be focused on reducing, you know, cost to serve and cost to operate, because um, there aren't a lot of meaningful solutions to help grow revenue other than you know maybe shipper CRM. Shout out shipper CRM, <laughs> uh, you know, which is which is which is is a very, very interesting product for exactly that reason. Like there's not a lot that's like, Hey, help me grow revenue. Uh, but there are a lot of opportunities for cost reduction and stuff. So, so folks are really, really, uh, you know, thinking a lot about that and, and then where can they, or should they invest in their business right now to be ready to catch sort of the, the market as it's, as it's swinging up. So there's a little bit more optimism than maybe there was last year. Okay. Um, and folks aren't in as much of a holding pattern as they sort of like have been recently. Sure. Those are my takeaways. Okay. Got it. In terms of market outlook, um, I don't know whether this will be a true statement or not, but like I would say since 2016, 2015, would, would you agree or disagree with the fact that things just become, be, started becoming more volatile and started oscillating in terms of market cycles, like the magnitude at which? So up until this market down cycle in, in the you know 15 or so years that I've been in the States, it seemed like they're not so much becoming more volatile as the cycle times are compressing. Okay. So, okay. 
So like they're just flipping more quickly. Um, and a lot of that I think actually has to do with data and the availability of, of data and kind of like yeah. the democratization of information around what's happening in the market. Uh, so broadly. Order, what second order effects do you think that that might bring cause but that, that the, there's a cycle behind oh. themselves actually get more compressed? Well, that's a great question. And I, I, I like that. <laughs> that might also be one that's like a little bit complex to answer. But I would say that like at a, kind of like my, my TLDR answer of that would be that um, sp speed of information is that which is more important, right? Like brokerage it particularly has always been a speed of information game. I have this information. Brokers do well when the market is moving, regardless if it's moving up or down. If the, the quicker they are to adopt that, uh, to internalize that information and do something with it, where brokers really struggle is where the market is stagnant. Right. And so like it's been for the last year and a half or two years. So so if the market times are pressed, the second order effect is going to be speed of information, onboarding that information and the decisioning off that information is going to be more important than ever. And then that kind of a lot like also leads into the concept of one of the other things that's in my I don't know who needs to hear this is uh, if you who need, I don't know who needs to hear this, but. If you're asking like, do I need to worry about margin compression? You're asking the wrong question because, uh, so I do think that being able to control your cost, your overhead and cost or cost to operate is going to be as more important than ever because you're, go you're not going to be in a situation where you can take dramatic steps in the operating model of your business or the staffing of your business or the spend for technology those are those are initiatives that take some time to play themselves out. I'm in the middle of a contract with A, B, and C tech vendor. If I give them notice to cancel right now, like I'm not going to see those savings for six months potentially. It's quote unquote savings, right, from not having to spend all. If I'm going to do a reduction in force, it's going to take me some time to figure out do I want to remove what have you. And so, being able to c compete in a low margin environment, make more money when things are good, be able to be competitive in a low margin environment or as another second order effect. That's going to be really important. That's good. Yeah. Good points. Very good points. How uh, much do you regret asking me to do this now? Oh, yeah, I don't regret right it at all. I'm time. glad that we, yeah. no, hell no. I have no regrets whatsoever. Yeah. Why, why would you it? Just say, this, no, just, I can just tell by your face, this isn't going the way you expected. No, it no, not at all. No, sorry. Sorry. This, we had literally a Korean barbecue. We ate like three pounds of Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Before that's this. Right. And, uh, kept over. That's right. I would. Yeah. We probably ate some raw chicken too. Um, yeah, that checks out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this has been amazing. I absolutely love this. It's, it's 424 right now. Uh, we have a few minutes just to wrap things yeah. up, Brian. Uh, always got to get to the airport. Yeah. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about your day-to-day -day metaphora? And so my job is, my day-to-day -day is amazing. <laughs> uh, my job, I have the best job in the world. My job really, like, my personal job just entails networking in the industry and meeting people and, like, learning about what people are working on, um, sort of trying to be a good steward of the industry, if you will, and, like, share share with people like perspectives and observations and things that we've learned, you know, or things that we are learning, you know, a lot of, honestly, most of my conversations are a lot like this, you know, with folks that are running multi hundreds of millions of dollars, billion dollar companies. Um, and like, what am I excited about? What am I interested in? What, what are we seeing about this, that, or the other? Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of my job. Um, and as a company, like when we are sort of like hired to help people, uh, with technology initiatives or, and whether that's strategy or it's actually like building an interesting application. Um, you know, it's, it's cool to see us have that impact. That's why I've been sure it's getting windy. This is crazy. Wow. That's just crazy. That's I'm like, Oh wow. Oh, okay. shit. so, uh, okay. Yeah. That's nuts. Probably why I close this, I guess we'll put it up. Um, yeah. So that's my, like, that's what we do, you know, and it's cool. Well, this is what you help, uh, I guess. Like, avoid, yeah. avoid, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. This is like when you walk into companies, like how companies are looking like, and they yeah. close the door. That's right, that's right, yeah. that's right. We help, we help yeah. close the door. Yeah, yeah. But like you know, I, I, I met with a. The cool thing about what we do. Oh, we're just podcasting here. Chris is about to get blown off the side of this building. We cannot cut this. We have to keep the. Yeah, no, we're keeping this for sure. We got to keep this in. How this is about to? It's oh. like I kept looking back because I'm like hearing these weird. So great agents. Wouldn't it be life-changing to have a higher commission split 
and a support team focused on helping you build your dream? At Tab, we pay our agents up to 80% of gross profit without compromising on technology or support. Make more money and guarantee a better experience for your customers and carriers by joining the team at Tab. It all starts with a short, enjoyable phone call with our leadership team to see the Tab difference. To learn more and schedule a quick call, go to tab-llc.com and change your future. I would say the really the coolest thing about what we do is this this industry is like really <laughs> Chris, it also doesn't seem like it worked, bro. And there's no latch. This there's no way to latch it. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out in a bit. But you know, if it opens again, then let's go do with it. But. The cool thing about the coolest thing about what we do. Yeah, but it's just wait, wait. It's just like she. At... Sorry. The coolest thing about what we do is really that like this 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 industry this business is like really broken. You know, yeah. like it it it's fundamentally just. <laughs> Dude, I love how you're talking it's about it. It's fundamentally like, broken like these <laughs> doors. <laughs> you know? And oh, my. Okay, all right. Let's just uh, roll this up. We're going to do this. Hi, it's all of it. I'm going to do this. perfect. This is going to be part of the podcast. Yeah. yeah. This up. We're not editing it. I get this out. This is the freight gods, like, literally yeah. not coming down on us. Not, the, the Chicago City freight gods. Yeah. And there's many of them here. Yeah. Yeah. Not in this room, but yeah, in the city. Exactly. I think we'll get it. Have you tried turning it off and turning it back on? Yeah, <laughs> that's probably what we'll work with. All right, there you go. Look at that beautiful view. I know, that view is so dope. I just leave it like this open. I just leave the door yeah. open. It's kind of hot in here anyway. Yeah, it is a little bit warm. Yeah. But, uh... All right, Wendy City. That will like, fix it. <laughs> I think this is the best view of the city, for real. Yeah, when I saw this view, I was this like, is the best. Yeah, this is gonna be perfect. I think it's the best view in the city. Oh, but yeah. of like any building that I've been yeah. in, yeah. like because you get you got, you know, if you're like in West Loop, okay, you're like looking downtown, but like we can see the lake over here. We can yeah. see all of downtown. It's just like you can see all of the the west suburbs. Like this is unbelievable. You could probably see all the way to St. Louis from here. You know, um, Actually, so we're there. Yeah, that way. That. Yeah. Okay. So the best thing that you guys do is. The best part about like what we do when we actually like you know are engaged by a company is just like we're working on things that make the day to day a like uh, existence of like those people in the seat better somehow because yeah. like it is you know I see the memes memes y'all put out and Boris puts out and whatever yeah. and it's like I like my first thought is like it it actually isn't they don't make me laugh they make me sad because like we've almost accepted that it's this fucked as a norm. As a norm. Yeah. Like, you know, the whole, like, hey, I'm a freight broker on vacation thing. Like, sure. And it's like, it doesn't have to be that way. And, like, yeah. just to kind of almost accept it as a norm that it is. And, like, think about what that does to, like, people's psyche and their lives and their health. And, you know, yeah. and, and, like, you know, how many people in this industry have substance abuse problems because of, like, yep. how stressful this job is. Like, you can't disconnect and de decompress and go on vacation. Like, that's the best part about my job now. Is, you know, is I can put my phone on do not disturb. A driver's not going to call me at three a.m. Yeah. screaming at me because the delivery number's not working. You know, and so we're working on things that can like help make their jobs better through, you know, through just kind of smoothing the workload out. Sometimes, like we can't change the way the industry operates or runs, yeah. but if we can help build a tool that just gets pe makes people's jobs easier, gets them the information they need more quickly, like, you know, able to head off, you know, head off problems before they come, you know, those are worth, those are things worth doing because it, it helps people have a better experience in their job. It's not about putting them in, out of a job. It's about being able to let them do things that they should be spending their time doing and, and smoothing the workload uh, you know, as a result of yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But overall, Metaphor offers a few services, right? Yeah. Can you just touch on that real quick? Those so services? we primarily do technology consulting. So we only work in truckload, or, uh, uh, sorry, transportation logistics. We work with shippers. We work with transportation providers like brokers and carriers. We work with freight tech companies. We work with private equity firms. We do things like, uh, you know, technology strategy. What do you have? What should you have? You know, how are you using what you have? What are what are you not getting the most out of? Blah blah blah. Uh, data data stuff to data strategy, um, and then we help people implement those strategies. So if it's buy stuff, we'll help you find the right thing. 
you know, the, the perfect fit for, yeah. for the use case. You know, we'll do implementation and uh, if it's build stuff, we'll help people build things. We have a couple of managed service offerings. We have a managed integrations offering. Um, and then we also have Socket, excuse me, we have Sick Logistics Training, which is a joint venture that does like learning and development for mm-hmm. for uh, for for transportation. Shout out McDangles. Shout out Hickleby. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay. yeah, that's us. Cool. We should have probably talked about this a little bit earlier, but it's already 4.30. I know you got a flight to catch, yeah. so I don't want to make you miss your flight because I don't know how traffic But hot take on, I, let's see, I'm gonna ask me the question while I call my Uber and we'll... Yeah, so... When two people love each other very much. Go ahead. What's the question? No, I mean, I was actually wondering how far away, oh, how bad traffic is right now. Oh, that's, it's going to be about an hour. Yeah. An hour? Okay. So you're, you like got to get going here any second. Uh, Probably. But like, let's see how long the Uber is going to take to get here. Um, Plate, that means international, domestic, American. Shout out to American Airlines. You going to Austin? Exec Platinum. No, I'm going to Cincinnati. Cincinnati? DQL? I mean, I can neither confirm or deny, but yes. Really? Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah. cool. I mean, I, like, they're not a current customer, but I'm working on it. Okay, nice. Yeah, we'll so see. Planet Cincinnati today. That's right. You hang out in Cincinnati, beautiful city. Um, the Queen City. TQL Stadium. No, no. Is, he, is, is Cincinnati the Queen City? I feel like you would know. He's like, I have Dar- no Dar- doesn't know. He's like, I have no fucking idea. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> just messing with uh, uh, Yeah. And then I'm home for a couple of days, then I go to Tampa. Then I go to Raleigh. That's next week. Raleigh work wise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Well, Worldwide. Mega Mega Fork or who's out there who's in Raleigh? <sighs> Bro, I mean, yeah. I mean like did I just name a big it? company and I'm like, that's who I'm going after. You know, did I, did I just name it again? Mega yeah, yeah. Really? Oh shit, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, but also like some of our like there's a we have a couple people in Raleigh. There's another like one of our customers has a couple people in Raleigh that I'll okay. see while we're there. Um, yeah, so Dude, I travel like seventy five percent of the time. I, I'm always you like it? I'm always on the road. I love to travel. Like yeah. it's it's um it can get to be a lot, but do you clock a million miles yet? No, not yet. I'm getting close, but you know, but I'm uh, lines? exact. I'm exact platinum. Okay. Uh, that part is that part is confirmed. But um it's it's it it can get to be a lot. I mean certainly like my wife doesn't love it, uh how much I travel. Yeah. But um but uh you know, it's 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 a great yeah, like I get to see people. I get to come. I get to see every, like we were talking about in prep, right? Like you go to I get to see like everybody's different offices. Like I get sure. to see, you know, I get to see all the cool things that people are working on. Like I get yeah. to, you know, I go take people to dinner and, I, and all the like bad parts about, you know, tra- the travel. They just don't bother me. Like uh-huh. flight gets canceled, whatever. It's like it happens. Like it just doesn't it doesn't face. Yeah. So. It's a great, uh, my job's awesome in that way. And again, like, I'm just curious. I'm just a curious person. So, like, you know, it's cool. Like, you get to see how everybody's making this, making things work or not work. Like, there's a, you know, there are certainly like, oh, this this doesn't usually work or this does you. But the th- the biggest thing I've learned from doing my job is, like, any strategy can work. It's all about, like, risk. And like what the, and like what the limitations of that strategy are, and then how you solve those. So like a good example is like what would be called the pod model. So like you know you have cradle to grave and you have buy sell as like kind of the you know the the main. But even one of the, every single one of those has their own flavor. So like the next sort of like step from cradle to grave is what would be like kind of a pod model, meaning like yeah. you have some some capacity focused people supporting a specific account. Yep. Like that never fucking works, except for the time when I went to a company that I won't name and like they had a pod model and it worked super well for them like super I think well. I know which company you're talking about are these Chicago bit Chicago no, and no. suburb base no no oh. they're out of Ohio oh. and um and not <laughs> not Cincinnati uh, <laughs> and and so it, it would be you, you wouldn't think of this company being based out of Ohio but worked super super well for them and it was like it was really interesting because I'm like cool why like, I just really want to fund, I want to fundamentally understand why. Like, oh. I want to dissect this and pick it apart. Like, the reason it worked for them, part of the reason it worked for them is, you know, in this pod, they had a pod of, like, four people, and everybody had a different, um, they, and then they also had, like, four different sort of, like, focus areas. Sure. And then they rotated. Like, every day, you did a different thing. That's 
So like today you might do account management. Tomorrow you might be the like problem solver person. Yeah. The next day you might be the capacity person. I forget what the fourth person sure. was. But yeah. like, and then you just rotate it. And so there was this built-in accountability of like, I'm not just going to like, if I'm the guy who's scheduling the appointments tomorrow, I might have to solve the problem of fucking up the appointment. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I might have to book the trot. It's really cool, honestly. Because totally. You get different. No day is no day is the Monday. Yeah. No day is similar. You rotate yeah. around and that's sure, right. Everybody experiences. Something. And you understand, like, and you understand, sort of like the the needs of the customer and blah blah blah. That's awesome. This All is right. great, Ryan. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ryan. Yeah, it's awesome. We'll have to do another one of Chad. Yeah, uh, yeah. You yeah. guys could do a, a threesome we'll together. A uh, we should <laughs> do like a whole. We should go do a deep. whole thing. Yeah. No, I mean, like you should you could spin up a whole other podcast. Like now you've got the Freight uh, Tech podcast. The Freight Tech podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk shit and then Christian could be the host of that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah, that would, yeah. that's uh, another totally thing. Down, but yeah. I'd be totally down. Yeah, what else are you doing? You know, you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, you know, whatever. Let's do oh, yeah. for sure. I mean, I, honestly, I would love to do that. Yeah, that'd be fun. We gotta figure it. Yeah, we could definitely do at least an episode. But cool, cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks awesome. for watching. Thanks, yeah. thanks for coming. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Daily Freight Caviar podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, or if you didn't, leave a review. Let me know what you think. I appreciate any feedback. If you'd like to have more Freight Caviar content, go to freightcaviar.com and subscribe to my email newsletter. Thank mm-hmm. you.